Amid this year's pandemic, there are signs that an unprecedented number of skiers, snowboarders, and snow machiners are heading into Alaska's backcountry this winter. With more people traveling in avalanche terrain, many worry that there will be more accidents and potential deaths. There's also a lot of fun to be had, so what can we expect and how can we do it safely? Snow safety experts and avalanche forecasters join us today for Talk of Alaska. Funding for Talk of Alaska was made possible in part by the Alaska Middle Health Trust Authority and listeners just like you. Thank you. And by... Alieska Pipeline Service Company, celebrating more than 42 years of Alaska operations. The views expressed on this program are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. It's Talk of Alaska. I'm Casey Grove. And if you're part of the backcountry ski, snowboard, snow machine community... You've probably seen certain equipment flying off the shelves or heard dealers talking about snow machines selling out. Maybe you've seen avalanche safety classes and trailheads filling up earlier than ever. Let's face it, there's less to do indoors during the pandemic, so naturally more people are heading outdoors, and that includes to Alaska's mountains. To help us understand the scale and the impacts of this surge of backcountry users, we're joined today by Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center Director Wendy Wagner, Hatcher Pass Avalanche Center Director Jed Workman and Alaska Avalanche School Director Melis Cody. We also have Blue and Gold Board Shop owner, former pro snowboarder Jason Borgstead on the line to talk about things from his perspective. First, though, you can also join our conversation. Are you heading into the backcountry for the first time, the thousandth time? Have you taken any avalanche safety training or have you ever been involved in an emergency in the mountains? Call us. The number is 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. In Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422. You can also email us at talk at alaskapublic.org and drop questions or comments on Alaska Public Media's Facebook page. We are streaming live there. And let's just jump right into this. I, you know, I think the first thing to talk about is maybe the risk and reward of backcountry skiing and snowboarding and snow machining. So to start out, let's talk about that. And I want to turn to uh, Jed Workman with Hatcher Pass Avalanche Center. Jed, why do people enjoy skiing or snow machining in fresh snow way up in the mountains? That's the reward, but along with the reward, there are risks. So what is the risk reward here? Well, I think we can all agree that it's just really fun. And unfortunately, with many things that we do, many outdoor pursuits, um, that comes with some level of risk. I mean, I think as Alaskans, we just love the outdoors. So we're constantly finding ways um, to engage with it. That could be a fisherman. That could be somebody racing the Iditarod. It could be somebody backcountry snow machining. Um, All of these things carry a certain reward, but they also carry a high enough level of risk. And sometimes that's our lives. Um, But we still come back to do it. And we continue to learn from that and share that with everybody we know because being in the outdoors is just a thrilling adventure, and it aids in our health, our exercise, and, and our well-being. It's a place we all want to be. And it's it's so different from sort of skiing at a resort and using a chairlift. This is like unsupported, in a lot of cases human-powered, and uh, very. you got to be really self-sufficient to be able to, um, to do this kind of uh, recreation. And I wanted to turn to uh, Wendy Wagner with Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center. What advice do you have for people, maybe because they're cooped up and this pandemic just drags on and on and they're wanting to get farther outdoors and they're maybe planning on skiing or snowboarding or snow machining in the backcountry for the first time? I know there's a lot of information out there, but but real quick, what should people know and how to how should they prepare? Well, first, Casey, thanks for having us on and uh, bringing this topic into Talk of Alaska. And, uh, yeah, absolutely what Jed said. There's lots, of, there's lots of fun to be had outdoors, and we need that for our mental health and being cooped up these days with uh, the issues with um, COVID. But first of all, if you're headed out into the backcountry and it's winter time, knowing where avalanche terrain is is critical because that is where avalanches happen. And it takes a whole host of education, and you can, we'll hear from Mellis here in a little bit, 
but education to know your terrain is the first thing. And there's a lot of ways to get there. But um, if you're not in avalanche terrain, you're not in avalanche danger. The problem is so many places we like to recreate are in avalanche terrain. And so that's why we're talking about this today. Yeah. And maybe we should back up here to maybe what some of the signs are that we're maybe expecting or seeing more people than ever out in these backcountry zones. And we're, you know, here in Anchorage, we're talking about Hatcher Pass or down in your area, Turnigan Pass. And I, I wanted to bring in uh, Jason Borgstad with Blue and Gold Board Shop here. We've heard stories about snow machine dealers selling out of snow machines and online retailers having avalanche gear on back order. Uh, Jason, you're a retailer here in Anchorage and the owner of the snowboard shop that sells both the equipment to get into the mountains and the avalanche gear like beacons, shovels, and probes. What are you seeing with uh, things selling in, in your shop? Uh, well, first, thanks again for having me. I am like the kid running through the candy store amongst uh, these three other dentists that are trying to save me from myself. So uh, I appreciate them at all times. But uh, we are definitely seeing a big surge of people trying to get outside. It really kicked in this summer uh, with skateboarding and has started to carry over once the snow hit. Uh, once people got over kind of the, the craziness of our election cycle um, and that snow coming down, they really started to charge the outdoors. Um, I have a clip from a GoPro where at the bottom of the run, uh, as I come out of the run, you can see 14 people switching over back to skins yeah. at the base of this portion of a run up at Tin Can. So we are definitely, we're definitely seeing a lot of, um, a lot of increase in the crowds. Um, we're seeing a lot more interest in backcountry in split boarding uh, in the shop. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to mention too. I mean, if if folks don't know what a split board is, maybe Google Google that. I've uh, had to explain what a split board is to a lot of people. Uh, basically, it's a way to go backcountry snowboarding uh, in a human powered way. Um, and in terms of selling split boards, I mean, have you seen many more people buying split boards in that kind of gear? Yes, uh, with the uncertainty of the resort situation, not knowing uh, if there will be restrictions or won't be, or just a general uncertainty, people have wanted to get, uh, take things into their own hands. I think that's why you see snow machine sales going up. Um, access to the backcountry is a way to keep a little bit more distance, uh, to take your adventure into your own hands. And um, so they grab a split board, which is basically, skis are just uh, not, or, or for people who haven't figured out how to put them together and make a split board out of them. <laughs> so we help them with that. Uh, we get them on the split board and then they are heading to the back country. Uh, I think the really important part though, is that we don't just try to sell a split board. We really try to take ownership of the entire process and, and a bit of a mentorship role and let people understand that when they say, I want a split board, what do I need? Well, you do need a board binding skins and poles, but you also need a beacon probe and a shovel. And then you need to, at the very least, watch some courses online um, and start to practice in your backyard. We, we try to um, package that as one whole thing rather than something that you could add on later uh, to to help them understand that that's part of the culture is embracing uh, how to do it without killing yourself or others. Yeah. And we had talked uh, prior to this show about this other part of this culture. And uh, we actually, we got an email from a listener also uh, down in Washington, Chris, who mentioned this kind of like us versus them thing going on. Um, and when you, when you think about maybe new users coming in and either new split borders or new skiers, new snow machiners, um, they might be trying to penetrate this like cool crowd, the sort of the more experienced folks that in some cases are, are talking negatively about inexperienced skiers and riders coming into the scene. And so, uh, Jason, before we let you go, I just wanted to touch on that idea as part of this discussion about sort of inclusivity and being welcoming rather than like, I was here first, so I'm cooler than you. How do you see that? Um, I, I, there's a little bit of the cooler than you, but it's more so, um, it, it's talking, it, it's a general narrative of talking down to 
people who are new to that zone. And in the, over the last five years of opening the shop, um, I've heard company after company and group after group saying, we got to get more people on split boards. We got to get people into the back country. And now that COVID has accelerated that um, at a rapid pace, I hear a different narrative talking about all these beginners and uh, that are going to cause problems in the back country. Uh, I think that that's a little bit tough for me to handle um, because that's not how, um, how we should be welcoming that crowd. We should say we should be embracing them and helping take a mentorship role along with that to say, hey, welcome, come on in. But as you come in, just know that we're all looking out for each other out here and we all carry a bit of responsibility for each other. Uh, just like there's etiquette on the skin track, uh, that, that's the trail you go up the hill on, on your split board or skis. Um, there's etiquette in, in endangering others or, or putting yourself in danger that you should look out for. And, and by just getting some basic knowledge, you really cut that curve quickly um, and, and it helps everybody. I, I've seen a lot of friendliness out there. I've not seen any animosity. We've come across so many people and everybody's saying hi to each other. So if we can just take that a step further and try to make a more welcoming narrative, then I think the new people will be more open to learning, more open to educating themselves and understanding uh, what they're getting themselves into. Uh, it's it's not something to be scared of. It's something to be um, uh to appreciate and to embrace, but also to respect. And, and as long as you do those things then everybody should have a pretty good time. Yeah. Um, well, I, I really, uh, I love the fact that, uh, you and I are split boarders and, and that we're holding it down for the split boarding crowd. So I, I wanted to just say, thanks, uh, Jason Borkstad with the uh, blue and gold for joining us, um, and representing the, uh, the snowboarder split border crowd, uh, and I wanted to turn to uh, Melis Cody with the Alaska Avalanche School, kind of on that same topic. What do you think about all of that, Melis? I mean, what are you seeing from a snow safety school perspective in terms of that, like us against them kind of thing, and just in general with your classes? And does it seem like most of the increase in new users are people that are brand new to snow safety concepts? Well, that's a great question, Casey. And I'm sorry to hear from the listener in Washington that that dynamic is something that they felt. Um, we just, you know, more so than this year, over the last five years, our Avalanche School has more than doubled in size. And then you layer on top of that this additional pulse of new interested uh, users that we've been able to measure pretty effectively. Like last year was a busy year and our first day of registration, we had nine people sign up. And this year we had 166 in the first 24 hours. And they were almost entirely in our introductory uh, courses. And I know the forecasting centers, um, you know, Jed and Allie up with HPAC and, and Wendy, um, with two guys, Avi and the Avalanche School, we typically spend so much of our time and energy um, doing trailhead workshops that are free, going into retail shops and delivering free lectures, um, talking about the basics and the equipment. So that's not the messaging you'll get from these organizations. Um, Avalanche Schools definitely weight their courses towards beginners and entry level users. So there's there's a lot of education products out there for those folks. Um, all that said, you know, sometimes we'll hear a frustration from instructors where someone will show up for a class and they're, you know, pulling the labels off their equipment. And there's just not enough time in an avalanche training course to show people you know, in depth how to use their equipment. So there is some expectation that you would show up, you know, being ready to travel. Yeah. And uh, I just want to throw out our number here again. Uh, this is Talk of Alaska. You can call us at 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. Please give us a call. In Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422. And you can email us at talk at alaskapublic.org. I'm monitoring those emails. I wanted to turn back to Melis here. 
Uh, to be clear, there, there's really no like official requirement that you have to take an avalanche class, right? I mean, it's it's recommended. Uh, it's not necessarily necessarily required. Yeah, you'll see on social media and so forth, people are looking for partners and they'll say things like, I only want to ride with somebody that's taken a course. And it's like, well, is that a reasonable expectation? But um, it is a metric to understand like what information somebody's been exposed to. You know when somebody's taken a class that they've been mentored by somebody with more ability and experience, they've been forced to practice with their emergency rescue equipment. So I can see how that gives somebody a peace of mind. Obviously, there's a lot of ways to uh, accumulate this information through self-study and traveling with people with more experience. Um, and all of that uh, makes sense. But it, it's really, you know, traveling in a really hazardous terrain is risky and it's intimate. And you know, people want to be assured, um, especially when you're introducing yourself to new partners, that, you know, they're making a good choice. And it's risky enough when everything's in your favor. So to miss something, like somebody doesn't have a critical piece of equipment, or you made an assumption about their knowledge, and they didn't have it, then, then you're, you're hanging it out there even more. So I, I can understand that mentality. You would want to know that somebody's had that exposure, and that can be really hard to quantify, and it's less so if you say, well, I've taken all these classes and all these steps, and this is what I've done. Yeah, there's a lot there to think about, right? And when we talk about rescuing, too, and, and that being a major component of the avalanche class, uh, maybe for folks that, that don't understand maybe what a beacon and a shovel and a probe are and what we're talking about when we say rescue, maybe, uh, Melis, could you explain what that even means? Yeah, well, it, there, uh, an avalanche is an incredibly uh, violent event. So you, you don't want to get caught. That's like step one. And knowing all the things you need to know to not get caught is really tricky, especially if you're in an area that isn't um, professionally forecast. But, you know, if you get buried under the surface of the snow and you don't have very specific equipment, um, the likelihood of somebody finding you before you run out of air is, like, pretty low. Um, and so we're so thankful that this technology exists. Uh, avalanche transceivers, people call them beacons. And if somebody's caught and you switch that from transmitting a signal to receiving a signal, um, these devices can help you kind of narrow down the field of an area to, to search and poke at the snow with a probe and, and dig somebody up. And the stats are, if your partners can't get to you in under 15 minutes, your chance of survival, granted that you weren't, you know, um, critically injured just in the violence and tumbling of an avalanche uh, is low. And so you need the right equipment. It needs to be modern. It needs to be sturdy. Uh, and you need partners that are well-versed with rescue. And, you know, I've been in this field for 20 years. And if I don't practice like quite a bit at the beginning of every season, hitting that target or that threshold of finding a buddy uh, in under 15 minutes, or as a professional guide, you know, we're trained to find multiple in that amount of time. Uh, it's not going to happen. So, uh, yeah, you need the right equipment. And you need a lot of practice every year. It's kind of like wearing your seatbelt or taking bear spray with you, like really hope that you don't have to use it, but it's good to know how to use it and to have it. And uh, to be clear, I mean, we're talking, you know, using a beacon to find another beacon that's attached to a person, maybe under some snow. And then using a probe, this like long metal probe to poke in the snow so you can find them and then a shovel to dig them out. So, I mean, when people leave the house in the morning, they're like, do you got your beacon shovel probe? You know, that's maybe as important as just having your skis or your snowboard or whatever um, to be able to do it. And I mean, speaking from experience, you know, I um, uh, definitely when folks are talking about going into the backcountry and they've either had a class under their belt or not, um, it, it really brings it home when you're practicing, like we were a couple of weeks ago, when you watch somebody try to find your beacon and they're maybe like struggling to find it. And you're thinking like, that's me under the snow. 
um, it, it's a lot more reassuring, I guess, to know that, you know, somebody's got a little bit of training. If they're going to be the one to try to, like, dig you out and you're the one that's buried, um, definitely feels better to know that they have some experience there. Um, and, and and I guess, Melis, you know, I mean, getting back to uh, the the classes selling out or, or at least filling up um, earlier than usual, uh, would you say that's pretty unprecedented? I mean, I, I, I think backcountry skiing and snowboarding is kind of increased in recent years uh, just generally, but uh, this year it seems pretty unprecedented. Is that is that about right? Yeah, normally we do quite a bit of marketing. We print posters, we do things on social media, we do things to fill our courses. So they do fill every year, but with quite a bit of effort. And now what we're seeing this year is I guess as of today, most of our courses are full with the wait list. So we have 493 students registered in this is day or multi-day uh, avalanche education, and we have 241 on the wait list. We opened up two courses in the last, you know, four or five days, and they're both already full. So we're doing the best we can. You know, avalanche courses don't grow on trees. It, um, it's hard to uh, get qualified staff and make sure we're not overrunning areas with education courses. But we know we're going to be like busy holiday weekends with, with normal backcountry traffic. So you can't just keep adding, adding, adding more and more courses. But all I can say is if you, you're not in a course right now, now is easier than ever to uh, get a lot of really good education online. And on the resources page of our website, alaskaavalanche.org, uh, we have links to some of our favorites. And uh, you can get quite a bit of information from there. Um, there's great books we could recommend. Um, but I would say, you know, it's hard to beat a day in the mountains with somebody with a ton of experience, like a day with somebody person to person in avalanche training is just so informative. And if it doesn't happen for you this year, you know, I, I would rec recommend it. Yeah. Um, and, and one more time, just to throw the number out there, uh, you're listening to Talk of Alaska. You can call us at 1-800-478-8255. In Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, and you can email us at talk at alaskapublic.org. I want to turn to the forecasters now, and uh, maybe starting with uh, Jed Workman there in Hatcher Pass. What are you seeing early in the season here with the number of people maybe heading up into Hatcher Pass? And, uh, you know, just uh, in terms of, I guess, Hatcher, you know, being one of the sort of the, the earlier places that you would see people being north of Anchorage, uh, how would you sort of quantify the, the number of people that you're seeing? Well, starting from last spring with the COVID pressure, um, often it was really hard to even find a parking spot. So, you know, the parking issues down in Turnigan are you know, may be due to plowing and some additional pressures there. Um, but just pure numbers and space to park is an issue at Hatcher Pass. And we're already seeing um, record people out on Thanksgiving holiday. So, so we know that we're going to see that problem again, and then that's going to produce the issue of overcrowding um, in the backcountry, which really makes um, the risk level go up. But I just wanted to um, come off of what Nellis was saying, because rescue practice is so important. Um, it was also mentioned that to learn how to travel through avalanche terrain takes a long um, time, maybe even a lifetime, to perfect. But to learn how to conduct a simple avalanche rescue you can learn how to do that very quickly, and you can do that right in your backyard. Um, so if you're a new person thinking about getting into the backcountry, you can really bring your level of responsibility up and help us all by practicing that, maybe even signing up for a course before you think about heading into the backcountry. And additionally, I just want to highlight the fact that there is so much avalanche terrain so close to the road. Um, last year, we had a fatality that was less than half a mile from the road, and it took four hours for people to find them. Mm -hmm. So you might think that you're next to the road and you're in, in a safe area where you have a lot of people to come and get you. Um, but the reality is that pretty much the minute you step off the road, at least at Hatcher Pass, you're in avalanche terrain, and it's kind of a backcountry environment where you and your partners are going to be your rescuers and nobody else. It's really who you need to rely on. Yeah. And, and it, it, like you mentioned, I mean, just the fact that you can get into trouble pretty quickly, like right out of the parking lot, 
Um, and, and we've talked about some of those parking issues, both at, at Hatcher and Turnigan Pass. There was a letter sent to the governor about uh, maybe a lack of plowing or, or budgeting for plowing in Turnigan that's led to people maybe parking alongside the road. And, you know, we're, we're in this pandemic. We can't carpool maybe necessarily with folks outside of our, our bubble that we would want to go skiing or snowboarding with. I know personally I'm, I'm really missing out on those long conversations driving up to Hatcher with my buddies. Um, but, you know, aside from the parking uh, in, in Turnigan, that would be the Chugach National Forest sort of area. I wanted to ask uh, Wendy Wagner with the Avalanche Center there, what, what are you seeing so far this year in terms of the number of people? Yeah, we're definitely seeing increased use and really great snow conditions over Thanksgiving week has brought a lot of people down to the Chugach National Forest. But um, we, we're anticipating the same thing everybody else is. The forest saw really high trailhead counts this summer, and it looks like that is just pushing into winter. And we just heard from Jason earlier in the show that he was at Tin Can the other day with a bunch of people. And I would like to say quick to piggyback on his comment that I think that's great. There are a lot of people getting out and we really do need to lead by example and be inclusive to all the new folks and all the people taking the avalanche classes and how they're filling up quickly this year. It's, I think that's a real positive thing as long as it comes along with this avalanche education piece. And I think Jason nailed that on the head earlier in the show, but, um, that is one of our big worries is many people in avalanche train at the same time. There could potentially someone could accidentally trigger an avalanche that could impact another group or another person. And we, of course, really do not want that to happen. But that is a little that is a reality when you have multiple groups in the same slope in the same terrain. And I mean, not to be too morbid, but obviously the worst outcome from something like this would be a death um, or, you know, multiple people being buried and maybe dying. So, I, I mean, I'm sorry to kind of ask this this uh, grim question, but Wendy, do you expect to see more fatalities than usual this winter? Well, that, I, you know, this winter will tell, but hopefully that's not the case Lots of times we get lucky out there, and we already have this year. There's been several large avalanches triggered, and no one has been caught. And hopefully that you know, trend continues where people aren't getting caught up in these incidents. But it is, it is reality that if we have more people out there, that can lead to more avalanche activity and more likelihood that we could have an increased number of fatalities and Alaska averages three and a half fatalities a season. And so we see that we see two to four fatalities a season. And so hopefully that hopefully we get through this year with none. And again, being a mentor and really looking out for other people and remembering our just common respect. And maybe we have to wait and let someone else get a first line on a slope or a first high mark up a hill and wait till they're done before we jump on it and things like that will really help if we're watching out for others as well as our own groups. I think that'll really help keep the fatalities down. And uh, Jed, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I, I know a fatality is really, it's it's just one data point, but um, is it, is, is that, I mean, do you, do you see potentially, you know, a big surge of users uh, resulting in maybe an increase also in fatalities? Well, I think that's entirely possible. And part of that is the setup for the season. Um, we have really weak snow at the base of the snowpack. And each time we get a storm, we get a bunch of avalanches. So we're in a cycle this season where the possibility is just much higher um, we don't have that safe snowpack that we would like to see. So you add on top of that increased numbers, and unfortunately that that's probably what it spells is some kind of accident, you know, and hopefully nobody dies. But I, I do want to reiterate the importance of that mentorship because and the inclusivity. And I think the way that works is people with experience need to identify people with less experience in the backcountry and be gentle in their advice to those people so that they're being inclusive and not um, heckling them. Yeah. Small pieces of advice 
um, when, when we travel in the backcountry as professionals, we like to be two, three people, a small team, and we like to have our own mountain. We don't like to be uh, – we don't like the, the chaos of not knowing what other people are going to do. So with more people, I think communication is, is more important than ever. So checking in with people at the trailhead, like, hey, where are you headed? What's your plan for today? Um, do you have a radio? I think a really important thing we want to get out there is that those little BCA radios that are so popular and hopefully more people are using them, um, each area tends to have a channel dedicated to that. So that just gives you the potential for more resources in, in an incident. And at Hatcher Pass, that channel is 420 for its obvious reasons, and, um, but that's channel 4, sub-channel 20. And everybody's monitoring that. So if there's an incident and somebody's near you, you could potentially call for help. And that's, that's a really big asset. You know, cell phones are spotty. InReach isn't going to get anybody there for an hour. So um, the communication and sharing your knowledge. Like we're looking at persistent slabs today on these aspects. This is what we're going to avoid. What's your guys' plan today? Um, I think offering that type of mentorship will go a long way and potentially even save lives this season. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for sharing that. And uh, we are going to take a quick break here. You're listening to Talk of Alaska, and we will be right back. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. If you have health insurance through Medicare, the time to make changes to your Part D prescription drug plan is October 15th through December 7th. You can enroll in, change, or drop your prescription plan. Check your plan and compare your options to see if you need to adjust your insurance coverage. If you need help deciding which one is best for you, call Alaska's Medicare Information Office at 800-478-6065 or visit medicare.alaska.gov. This message sponsored by DHSS. All right, you're listening to Talk of Alaska. I'm Casey Grove. You can give us a call and join the conversation. Call us at 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. In Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422. We're talking to snow safety experts about a surge of new users heading into the backcountry this winter, skiers, snow machiners, snowboarders. Um, now, I, I, I wanted to uh, turn to uh, Melis Cody with the Alaska Avalanche School. Um, Melis, uh, you're in the business of teaching people, among other things, how to rescue people from an avalanche, potentially. And we've talked about more people being in sort of, you know, so, some of the same zones, maybe being on the same peaks and skiing and snowboarding. Um, is, it, is it possible also that having more people in those zones means more potential rescuers, too? Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. We just did our staff training, um, and something that we were talking about is we have courses, you know, every weekend all winter. So the chances of one of our courses witnessing an incident just seems particularly high this year. Even during staff training at Turnigan, they witnessed, you know, a human-triggered avalanche. And so something that we've done is just add a little more to our kits to be able to assist the general public. We are not a search and rescue team. That is not our mission, but we do know by virtue of where we are every weekend, what we might see. Um, We've preset messages on our two-way satellite devices uh, in reaches. And so we added one that said, you know, witnessed public emergency. I, you know, I dispatched our SOS button for a non-school related emergency. That way, if that button gets pressed, we, you know, at the school don't, you know, uh, cycle up a response for something that we would, you know, normally prepare to do for, for our own uh, instructors and students. But we would, you know, make sure when 
we got that notification that we could do anything we could do to help, you know, a member of the public. So there's, there's some things that we have done just kind of anticipating, um, you know, hopefully more accidents don't end up be more fatalities. Hopefully they're survivable. We all learn from them. And our hope is, you know, education is constantly evolving and we hope this is a really good learning season. If there's a lot more people in the backcountry, there's a lot more lessons learned, you know, that could, you know, make our education products, you know, more database and, um, you know, more current with, you know, what we're continually learning to be best practices for traveling in tricky terrain. Yeah, um, that, that's a good point. I mean, you know, maybe having more eyes on the scene is, is going to help uh, help the situation. Um, we actually have a caller here. Uh, it's Justin in Anchorage, and uh, he's got a question about uh, finding new terrain and uh, maybe new partners, I think, too. Um, Justin, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So uh, go ahead and ask your question. Um, so I'm a avid backcountry snowboarder. I've been snowboarding for 30 years and doing backcountry for about 10. And uh, I'm new um, to Anchorage from the lower 48. I've lived in Colorado, Montana, and Utah. And uh, one thing that I know is, um, you know, you, accidents are, are very much avoidable. If we can put um, people together as far as uh, veterans of um, local terrain. And um, so as somebody who's an experienced snowboarder, um, and split border. Um, I was wondering, are there any social media groups or any other outside groups um, that would be geared towards um, something that I'm looking for um, as far as, you know, people who are, who are veterans of the area and, you know, bringing people together so that um, uh, new guys like myself can, can learn the terrain? Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, who should we send that question to? Uh, uh, Wendy Wagner with uh, Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, maybe some of the other folks want to chime in, but there's a Facebook page called Alaska Backcountry Ski Addiction, and that has a lot of information I think you would find interesting, and I know a lot of people connect, have connected on that um, Facebook page, but I don't know if any any other of the speakers have a, any other platforms. Yeah, that's that's the main one I've seen. Alaska backcountry ski addiction. Uh, Jed or Melissa, do you guys know of any others? My well, I think one thing you can do. Jason's no oh, longer ahead, on. Is you know connect at your local board shop, and uh, that's where you're gonna you know especially in the splitboarding community. That's kind of a narrower look at where you're gonna find um, good partners. Yeah, Jed. Sorry, I kind of directed you guys right into each other. But uh, did you have something to add? Oh, no, that's, that's great. Um, you know, I think this has always been a difficult thing to achieve. Anybody getting into this sport has always asked that same question, Justin. And you probably went through it in the beginning of your experience um, backcountry. And I'd be curious to hear how, how it worked for you. Um, but typically, if you get out into the backcountry, you can do it by sticking to slopes that are, you know, 25 degrees or less. And you can still go out and have a safe day on your own. And then you start to meet the people that are actually out there. Um, and once you develop the relationships with people that are in the local area, that quickly blossoms and opens up to a lot of other um, people that you can join in and become partners with. So I think just meeting your local community and getting out there. Yeah, there's a, I, be, I believe there's a split board forum online, too, that I've uh, met a couple friends through that um, – started out as just kind of one-time tours uh, and and we ride together all the time now um, and that's kind of a split board specific thing and I'm I'm blanking on exactly what the name is but I think if you googled uh, split board forum there's a message board there and you can start to kind of meet new people um, we, we also have an email here from uh, Ralph and I'm not sure well where Ralph is but uh, Ralph was asking kind of more about what it's like to take a new partner into the field and the question is, what is a reasonable staged approach to take with your new partner once you're in the field? Um, so talking about kind of what specific things would you do if you were the more experienced person taking somebody brand new along with you? Um, and maybe I'll throw that one to uh, Melis. Yeah, it's hard to, uh, you know, understand the human dynamics. All I can say is, you know, they're, 
there's some real risk traveling unsupported in the backcountry. And so you're wearing a lot of hats when you do that. You're saying that, you know, I can successfully read how hazardous the the snowpack is. I can understand how the weather is changing throughout the day. I know how to do a rescue. I have first aid experience. I know how to, you know, handle somebody if they're scared or they're too hyped up and you know to some extent you're like a therapist and so you know I, I, that's not a lot of doors you want to open with just anybody um you know all that decision making that has to happen and so forth so I would say if you're at the trailhead with somebody you don't know well make it so that the terrain isn't the big distraction you can just work on forming a relationship and trust and understanding how you make decisions, what you notice, kind of developing patterns of behavior. Because the harder the terrain you encounter there is, the more distractions that you have and the harder it is to make good decisions. It's a really high-performance sport. Yeah. And Ralph has this kind of follow-up question about the human factors to be aware of in new backcountry partnerships. And I think there's this concept, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's called the golden halo. And you teach that in your classes. And I, I, I think it actually maybe applies to a lot of things, not just really backcountry travel. But tell me about what the golden halo effect is. Well, if you're with somebody that has a lot more experience, like for instance, if I if I went out with one of these other people, you know, on right now, Wendy or Jed, they spend, you know, most days out in avalanche terrain. Jed's, you know, a heli ski guide. Um, Wendy's like a really experienced snow machiner and skier. And even though I have quite a bit of training and experience. I would, I would automatically be a bit self-conscious about like, oh, I've, you know, been in the office for two weeks. I'm not really getting out. This is your backyard. You forecast for this area. And that uneven balance in decision-making is really risky for Jed and Wendy and I. You need somebody to bounce ideas off because they're complex decisions. They need to be looked at from multiple angles and perspectives and ultimately it comes down to you know do you feel safe and that's a very very personal um, decision and you need to be able to communicate that with somebody else so when they talk about expert halo it's really easy to be quiet when you think you're with somebody of more experience but you'll hear this from pilots and backcountry ski travelers as you know they want everybody to have eyes on um and you might very well notice something they don't because they're paying attention to something else. So it's almost always the most eyes, the better. And you really have to create a dynamic where everybody feels comfortable speaking up in the minority rules. And we teach that in decision making. But do you guys have other ideas? Yeah. How about you, Jed? What do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I think as a heli ski guide, I'm often taking people out into the backcountry, and I'm taking 100% of the risk in, in terms of evaluating it and making the decisions. Um, I'm not relying on those other people to participate in that. Now, I will definitely use their observations and their eyeballs, and I'll be asking them questions. But really, if you're with a sort of an imbalanced team, I guess, of, of skill, I just think you need to come back to the travel protocol. I mean, this is one of the things that's really going to save our butts out there. It doesn't matter what your experience level is, but sticking to traveling on in avalanche terrain, one person on the slope at a time, not putting a second or third on there, because if more than one person gets buried, the avalanche rescue process becomes exponentially complicated really need to minimize that because no matter how expert you are, you can still end up in an avalanche. So one person on a slope at a time, everybody else is a spotter, their eyes on you all the time watching. So if the most experienced person is first one down, they have all those other people carefully watching that for that last point scene if they get caught, because that's going to speed up the rescue effort. Remember, we only have 15 minutes. Um, and then the communication through the day as a mentor, I think when we're taking people through the backcountry, we're consistently communicating what we're seeing, and then we're asking people to reciprocate that back, 
and to add what they're seeing and to work through this process of decision making and interpretation through the day, but then always coming back to the simple um, travel protocol. And, and it will be those more complex things that will just take years of experience. Um, but that's we can offer those tidbits throughout the day. Um, and I just wanted to add with the travel protocol, the the incredible safe, um, importance of identifying all the safe zones. Um, so if somebody's sitting down the slope and they get to the bottom, they're not done. They need to move to the identified safe zone, which is well outside of anywhere an avalanche can come off the mountain and get you. And so we're all working through this travel protocol system, and I think that's really managing the terrain and the avalanche hazard and enabling us to take out people with less experience than ourselves. Um, obviously, we're carrying a, a big um, responsibility there, as Melis mentioned, but that travel protocol is so key. Yeah. Well, uh, you're listening to Talk of Alaska. We're going to take another quick break, and we will be right back. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. If you are at home with someone who makes you feel unsafe, help is available. The Strong Hearts Native Helpline is here for you if you are experiencing domestic violence. You are not alone. Call 1-844-762-8483 or visit strongheartshelpline.org. This message brought to you by the Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. All right, you're listening to Talk of Alaska. We're talking to snow safety experts about a surge of new users heading into the backcountry this pandemic winter. We actually have a call from uh, somebody that's heading into the backcountry as we speak. It's uh, Bob, I think, driving to Turnigan Pass. Bob, are you there? I am. You had a question about uh, gear proficiency? Uh, yes, and uh, ironically, I'm stopped just south of Girdwood while they do avalanche control. So <laughs> avalanches are real. Uh, but uh, one of the things I've not heard from the experts, we've talked about mentoring, but one of the best ways is to uh, do a little practice before you go into the field. Bury a piece of plywood, hide a beacon, take five, ten minutes, make sure everybody knows how to put their probe together and what a beacon sounds like. Uh, I've met so many people that they've got all this new fancy equipment and they, they're unsure as how to turn it on and how to use it. So a little bit of practice goes a long ways to having a safe, uh, fun day. Yeah. Well, Bob, can I ask you, are you heading up to Turnigan Pass to get into the backcountry? Uh, unfortunately, no. This is uh, work-related, this trip, but uh, it uh, it is something I do like to do. Okay. Well, hopefully you're getting paid by the hour there if you're uh, waiting for the avalanche control. Um, maybe we'll uh, we'll throw that one to Mellis. What, what do you think about that, Mellis, in, in terms of the, the practicing with your gear outside of a class, maybe? Yeah, that's always encouraged. It's really been a wake-up call for me that in the last couple of years, we've started offering professional-level courses that people need for, you know, snow careers and fields. And the entry level exam for these courses is pros that have been practicing for, you know, an incredibly long time have to find, um, you know, two beacons and under seven minutes in a 50 by 50 meter square buried a certain depth. And um, we've continually seen even experts struggle with it and a little bit of practice solves the problem right away. And so that's something you can do, um, you know, pretty easily yourself, but you do need more than one, more than one beacon to pull off a practice. So you can do it in the backyard. It doesn't, uh, you don't have to go anywhere fancy to be able to do it. It's a really fun thing to do with kids. Um, but, uh, and then we're finding more and more ski areas trying to put up beacon parks so that people can practice, you know, at the base of the list, which is really helpful. Yeah, I think, uh, does Alieska have one of those, perhaps? Uh, I know they have the equipment. I know Ski Talk uh, up near the base of Hatcher Pass is talking about installing one. Um, so hopefully, yeah, it's something we can get going this season. So we had a... Oh, go ahead. Uh, just mentioning, yeah, we do have three beacon checkers at Trailheads um, for people to make sure that their beacon is sending out a signal. It doesn't do the reverse function, but it, it does that minimal thing. And that those signs are full of basic information before you're heading out into avalanche terrain. 
And just to tag on to the, co- the, uh, the question that came through and what Mellis is saying about practicing with your gear, it's so important. We had a fatality in Grub State Gulch, which is on the Willow side of Hatcher Pass. And one of the key problems was getting to their friend in time. And unfortunately, that person had not installed their probe ever. Mm. And when they did, they pulled it out and it was basically tied and spun, spun up in a knot. And so it took him 20 minutes. And again, to, to get this thing deployed. And again, you have 15 minutes to save your buddy. So I think what the, the call-in person brought up is a really important aspect is to check all of your gear every season and know how to use it. Um, we know from experience that if you stick to the gear that you own and you're not trading it out, you're sticking to the gear you own, you practice it, no matter what you decide to buy, you're going to be best with that unit. So being well-oiled and practiced with your equipment is really crucial. And you hear stories, too, I mean, about the the gear itself. Um, I know when I was first going out, I had kind of a cheesy shovel, you know, that maybe uh, wasn't going to stand up in a real situation and uh, have since upgraded and got a stronger shovel. But, I mean, when you're talking about 15 minutes, some of that is just shoveling maybe through a bunch of uh, dense avalanche debris. And uh, if you're using a shovel that, you know, you might have just kept in the back of your car for an emergency situation, and and now you're dealing with a real avalanche situation. You might uh, might want to consider um, upgrading your shovel and those kind of things. Yeah, but, don't don't buy the one that's in the little um, display thing next to the gasoline tank when you fill up. Yeah, that's not the shovel you want. Yep, um, that is good for like if you get stuck on the side of the road. But no, you'll want to go into the shops and you'll want to talk to the pros about what to get. And make sure that you get the sturdy, best equipment possible. And, and Jed, I, maybe this is a question for you. I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was uh, you or Chugach that had posted about the um, Avalanche Center down in Southeast. But we had a question here from Southeast about what sort of resources folks in that area can look for um, outside of South Central. And you know, what sort of uh, backcountry safety and, I guess, um, avalanche forecasting can people down in Southeast look for? Well, I think the good news is there's a new avalanche center down there. Um, They're going to have limited capacity. They're just starting up. It's a progressive model. Uh, But there'll be the sharing of information, which is such a critical component to this. One of the most popular places that people go on our webpage is the observations platform. So if you're out there and you see an avalanche or, or you see signs like shooting cracks or you're getting lumping, like collapsing, big um, collapses of snowpack underneath you, That's like really good information to share with our entire community. And that platform is shared through the Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center and with Hatcher Pass Avalanche Information Center. So getting that information out to the public is is really important. And that's what Southeast is starting with. And and hopefully it will grow into a full on avalanche center. But I would consider that my hub for information um, if I was in Southeast. And those of us here in South Central, of course, I mean, we look to uh, your your Avalanche Center, Hatcher Pass, that's hpavalanche.org, I believe, and uh, Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center, cnfaic.org. Um, though, like you said, I mean, lots of observations there, photos, um, definitely when people have close calls, they often will post about it, and uh, you can really get a lot of good information just from going to those websites. Um we got another caller here. It's Mark in Juneau, and he's got a question about educational resources for kids. Mark, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the great show. Um, some of my friends and I have been uh, skiing with our middle school age youth and younger, and I've just um, heard that uh, common wisdom is not to teach kids under 16 about avalanche safety. So I just wanted to see what kind of um, best practices there might be for teaching kids middle school age and younger about basic avalanche awareness. Yeah. Um, Melis, maybe that's a good question for you. Yeah, it's been wonderful um, to see so many kids exploring the backcountry with family members and, and mentors. But um, a couple of things to think about is you know, even though they're physically capable, sometimes in the same way adults are, there's so much complex decision making that um, wouldn't necessarily make them the best backcountry partner because 
you know, what is their mental state if they have to rescue a family member? So just kind of understanding the risk you're exposing youth to is important. Uh, we still understand education is uh, important for youth. In South Central, we do one-day clinics, normally at a resort. They're called Backcountry 101. So they can learn about the difference between what ski patrollers do versus what you're kind of expected to do for yourself in the backcountry. Um, online, there is so much wonderful stuff for kids. Um, there's a Know Before You Go program, um, and they have like a five-part free e-learning series that I would highly recommend. If your young one is a snow machiner, there's another free online training program called Backcountry Ascender. And now that kids are so good at online learning, um, those are two things I would point to. And then lastly, um, there's a program that's helping teach young ski racers a bit about what it means to go into the backcountry, what happens if they dip, dip out of the, um, uh, under the lines at a ski resort, and that's called the mm -hmm. Brass Foundation. And so we have all these links on our website under resources on alaskaavalanche.org. And uh, I, I also wanted to ask, Melis, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, some of the online learning that's going on. And uh, I, t I take it that the avalanche uh, safety classes that, that you're teaching this winter, those have changed quite a bit just because of the pandemic, right? Yeah, we've had major adaptations to pretty much every, every uh, part of our um, program as a result of, you know, trying to make safe delivery models. Uh, being respectful to the risks of the pandemic. And so we've poured tens of thousands of dollars into online learning and videos so that people can experience our lectures without being confined in small spaces with um, people outside of their households at this time. And then the advantages that's made our courses now have longer field days. So uh, our students will meet in small groups. They'll stay with one instructor the entire time and uh, they'll be prepared to um, be out and about and learning in the mountains. So hopefully um, that'll feel good for our students this season, that they can still get an education kind of against so many odds. And uh, to to kind of talk about what to expect maybe when this is all over, when the pandemic is over, whenever that is, um, what, what's like a normal level one avalanche class like? It's it's like a three-day thing, and, and oftentimes you, you might like stay in the same place, right? Yeah, a, a typical entry level course is three days. You would be in a group of, you know, 18 students with three or four instructors, and there'd be some combination of indoor exercises and lectures. And then during the middle part of the day, which typically is the lightest and the warmest in the winter, uh, you go out and you do field exercises, and then you come back at the end of the day to debrief, um, prep for the next day, and encounter a few more. Uh, topics through lecture. Yeah. So that'll look different for students uh, this year. Yeah, and uh, I think sometimes there's a potluck in there somewhere too. I enjoyed that myself. I mean, I really enjoyed having this conversation with you all. Uh, that was Melis Cody, the director of the Alaska Avalanche School. We also had Wendy Wagner, director of the Chugach National Forest Avalanche Information Center, and Jed Workman, the director of the Hatcher Pass Avalanche Center. Had uh, Jason Borgstead from Blue and Gold Board Shop on earlier. Thank you all for being here. We have our engineer, Ammon Swenson, producer, Zachariah Hughes. I'm Casey Grove, and uh, thanks for listening to Talk of Alaska. Talk of Alaska is a production of Alaska Public Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Views expressed are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Today's program is available online at alaskapublic.org. This is Alaska Public Media. Alaska Public Media.